greetings to you beautiful people, uh, those of you watching at home, those of you watching throughout the building. Uh, th this month, all this month, we get to celebrate the great gift. We get to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, and, and we're going to do it uh, in four sermons, all from John chapter 1. Uh, but to, to kind of think about the great gift, I want to talk about birthdays for a second, because I'm fully convinced the third birthday is the real birthday. It's the first real birthday, because... Let me explain it this way. See, on the first birthday, you have no clue what's going on. And in fact, you think your parents are kind of kooky because they've been trying to teach you for so long how to eat and, and, you know, correctly, and then they're like, hey, just smash this cake. And not only that, but they're waving their phones in your face. And they're like, listen, hurry up. Instagram's not going to wait for this. You smash this cake. Okay, so first birthday, you're like, I don't know what's going on. By second birthday, you're utterly confused because you're like, I've seen these people. Why are they here? I usually only see them once or twice a year. Why are they all here? What's with the stack of gifts? And two, you're really suspicious. But let me tell you a story. By, by age three, little Julian walks into her closet, and she opens the box because in the box are the shoes, the favorite shoes, the special shoes. And so she sets those on the floor, and then she reaches up into the rack. It hasn't been worn yet because this is a special day. She grabs that special outfit that she has been thinking about for weeks, how she couldn't wait to wear it on this, her third birthday. And she's going to school that day with just the excitement of knowing there's going to be cake and there's going to be those weird people again. They're going to show up because today is her birthday. And I've got, if, guys, if you can play it, uh, the next slide, I've got a little video clip. I mean, we, we kind of feel that, don't we? I mean, there's like, I would be all pulling hair out too. It's the special day. It is that day. It's, it's our day. There's gifts. There's presents. There is a candle on a cake. And it's for us to be the ones that get to blow it out. Oh, and to have someone else come in the way. To have someone else. We got a season of celebrating. We've got the birth of a king. Uh, we're going to be in, in verses 19, 19 through 21 in John 1. And, and what I want us to see, so John chapter 1, it doesn't have the birth narrative. We don't have a manger. We don't have, um, we don't have uh, little animals or angels showing up around the manger. John 1, as, as the Mahler family read for us, it just dives straight in. But what we do have is we have a relative named John uh, that's going to celebrate the birth of a king and the beginning of the ministry uh, of his Messiah. And so for four weeks, we're going to look at that and go through that. And um, I want to start by backpedaling a little bit before verse 19. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this is not John, the author of the book. This is John the Baptist. How did he get a last name like the Baptist? I don't know. But he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And, and I want to emphasize this, verse 9, it's the reason for the season, guys. Because some of you, you've gotten to this month and things are like, can we just get to next year? Some of you have gotten to this month, you're like, wait, it's December already? I have not done my spring cleaning yet. But the reason for this season, the reason to celebrate the birthday, the reason to celebrate the Savior is this verse right here. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. But to get to this true light, to get to this, there's a question you have to ask yourself. And I'll say this, the most important question you can ask yourself this season, it's, it's nothing to do with gifts. It's nothing to do... Uh, you know, of who needs what or what needs what. The most important question you can ask yourself this, this season, and it's in the context of how we receive verse 9. And here's the question. 
and not only asking it, but how do we answer it? And the question is, who are you? This question is pressed by the Pharisees, by the leading religious council in, in John 19. They're sent out, like, hey, there's this guy, he's doing, he's doing some stuff. He's out in the woods, he's dressed like Elijah. Scripture tells us that Elijah was a man that kind of dressed kind of wild, wore animal skins, ate off the land, and all of a sudden we've got this other guy. Go figure out who this guy is. And so they come to him, and, and, they, and they just look, you're baptized. Who, who are you? And this question is one that we have to answer too. This question is one that we've got to examine ourselves and, and how we answer this question will determine how the birthday party goes. How we answer this question will determine how we receive Jesus. How we answer this question, it's going to determine the entirety of the Christmas season. Okay? You know how some of us, I mean, we're just, we don't, we can't get through the holidays without things just not feeling right and correct. The question is, who are you? And John gives this response. He says, I am not the Christ. Some of your translations, they may say, I am not the Messiah. Or some of you may have the little notation that says, I am not the anointed one. It's not a term we use too often, but we, we saw this just happen recently. Okay, we saw a, a, a fat-handed Prince Charles be anointed as the new king of England. We see that anointing being, this is now your calling, this is what you are becoming, you are now the king. And we as Americans, we don't really like kings. Let's be honest, we, we had that at one time and we're done with it, we're just, we don't really like kings. And so we'll, we like the king to be kind of over there and dealing with things over there, where maybe I could pay attention but I don't have to listen to you, okay? Because kings get in the way of our tea, you know? Kings get in the way of our property. Kings get in the way of, of us. And so we, we really don't like kings. We kind of like the idea of kings. And so we need to be like John. And I'm going to paraphrase throughout this, throughout this sermon what he says. That can, we can look at the question, who are you? Are you the anointed one? Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Or, or in context, are you the king? And we have to be able to say, not I. It's not me. I am not the one. And, and I want to get us to a place of understanding. If we're going to grasp this season, if we're going to understand what, what Christmas is all about, it's only in knowing what we are not that we can truly understand who Christ is. Okay? It's only in knowing that I am not Jesus that we can really celebrate Jesus. It's only in saying that I am not the king that we can celebrate the king. I explain this in a different context. We're sitting um, holiday season, Thanksgiving time, and uh, you may not have known this, but soccer was going on as long with football. And uh, there was a FIFA game. We were sitting around as a family watching uh, with uh, the brothers and the nephews, and we're all scattered around. But in one of the breaks, which by the way, with soccer, there's only one break. It's half. There's like no ads in between. It's really crazy. There's just they just keep playing. It's amazing. But anyway, there's this long break, a lot of ads in the middle, and I watch, as one of the ads come on, two of my nephews just start singing it. Mind you, hold off for a second, these two nephews, just a few months prior, were in the Middle East on the mission field. This is how quickly we've Americanized them, okay? A few months later, a commercial comes on, and it's a, a Burger King commercial, and two of them start singing, have it your way, you know, BK, have it your way, and I'm thinking, wow. Now, I remember this ad from growing up. Apparently, there was a time way back when, I don't remember this, like if you said no ketchup on your burger, they just kicked you out. I mean, like, no, leave. But then Burger King's like, hey, you know what, have it your way. Have it your way. But there's something that's been added to this, this BK slogan. I don't know if you guys have caught it. That at the end of the Burger King commercial, have it your way, they then say two words. You guys know what they are? It's subtle. They've snuck it in. They say, you rule. And I'm watching as my nephews are sitting there singing this ad, and both of them, same time, go, you rule. I'm thinking, that's not good. We've ruined them. They, they've only been here a handful of days. They're ruined. But this, why would Burger King turn this into the, their commercial appeal if it wasn't for the fact that it really rings true to our ears? We want to say, I rule. We want to have it our way. 
We want to look and be a part of the party and go, you know what, I'm just going to claim this cupcake, I'm going to claim this candle, I'm claiming all the gifts, it's all about me. I'm going to have it my way in this moment. And that's the American way. The reason we don't like kings is because we don't want to see someone else wearing the crown we want to wear. And so the question is, what's your, what's your BK mentality? And, and what I mean by this is, do we look at Jesus and we think, no, 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 I'm the better king. And we don't say that. But we sure do act that way. I know you're king, I'm the better king. Or is our BK mentality, I want to belong to the king. And, and it's one or the other. We may not so explicitly state it, I'm the better king, but we live that way and we act that way. Or we have to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and say, I want to belong. I want to belong to the king. And the only way we can do that is to remove our crown. The only way we can do that is to bow down. The only way we can know another king is by removing ourselves from that mantle where we have self-anointed ourselves the greatest, the grandest, and the king of our lives. It's only in that place where we can really say, you know what, Jesus, you're the better king. I want to belong to you as king. I want to belong to you. But the questions to John the Baptist keep going in the text. And in verse 21, he says, I'm not the anointed one, I'm not the Messiah. So they ask him this. They said, you're acting a whole lot like, you're kind of, kind of appearing like Elijah. And they say, are you Elijah? Are you Elijah? And John's going to say, I'm, I'm not. He's going to say, not me. But what's really interesting, as we go through Scripture and throughout the Gospels, Jesus describes John the Baptist as Elijah. Wait a second. John says, I'm not. Jesus says he is. What's that, what's that mean? I'll tell you this. There's a lot of things that we say I'm not and God says we are. Let, let me explain. We may say in our life, we may say, I'm a mess. I make a mess of things. I struggle to keep things together. And we say, this is our identity. When John, when John looks and says, I'm not Elijah, I'm John the Baptist, and Jesus looks at him and says, you're Elijah, you're the one that's calling out. See, we look, we say, I'm a mess. But this is what God says about us in Ephesians 2.10. He says, you're God's masterpiece. I have created you anew in Christ Jesus so you can do the good things that I've planned for you. See, I vocalize, I go, I'm a mess. Have you seen the messes I make? Have you seen the problems? He goes, no, you're my masterpiece. I've chosen you, I'm calling you, I'm claiming your identity. Well, and then, but we'll go on. We'll say, listen, listen, okay, you say masterpiece, but the problem is, God, I know that, that frankly, I'm, I'm pretty rotten. I'm pretty rotten. I polish this thing up to look good in front of other people, but deep down, I'm, I'm a pretty awful guy. There's some dirty thoughts. There's some awful things. I am rotten. But then God says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. That through Christ, we, who fully understand I'm rotten, can become the righteousness of God. And all of a sudden, things don't compute because we know who we are and yet we're told who we are and they're two very different things. The problem is, and this is where we get to looking at that verse that we, we talk about, and this is the reason for the season, that the true light is coming. The true light is coming. And the problem is we will fail to see the true light if we do not recognize we're in darkness. Okay, if we think, you know, things are pretty peachy. Things are good. I'm doing great. I'm a good guy. I'm living a good life. And, and I don't really have problems. We don't find the light when we're already deciding we're in the light. But it's those that truly understand the darkness of their soul, the darkness of their thoughts, the darkness of the ways they think. But we're told this, when we say, I, I know who I am. In 1 Peter 2.9, it says, you're not like that. 
He said, no, 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 I know I'm rotten. I know I'm awful. I know I'm in darkness. And we're told by the good book, you are not like that. You are chosen. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation. In fact, you're God's very own possession. You don't even belong to yourself anymore. God's called you. God's claimed you. And as a result of that, you could show others the goodness of God as he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we can look at each other and go, man, I'm, I'm different than you. I'm different than you. I'm, I'm not the same as you, but man, I, I've got the problems. And we can look as Jesus says to John the Baptist, you have the same spirit of God. You have what Elijah has, and that is one that's crying out into the darkness for people to come to this place of repentance. And that's why we could fully say, I'm a mess. And God says, you're my masterpiece. And so we can look at it and go, I'm not, I'm not. And he says, but you are, you're mine. You belong to me, I've called you. I've given you the light. So you'll live for me and so you'll know me. The Pharisees, the leading religious council, they're going to ask one more question. It's the same question, but they don't realize it. They're going to ask him, they say, are you the prophet? Now, they're looking back at the Old Testament text, and, and they know that there's an anointed one coming. They know that there's going to be a second coming of Elijah. They know that there's a prophet coming. That anointed one, that prophet, they are one and the same, and that is going to be Jesus Christ. And how do we think John's going to answer? He is once again going to double down, and he's going to say, not I. It's not me. I'm not the prophet. I'm not the one that you know. I'm not the guy. I'm not the one. And I want to say, take this for, for a second to understand something. When you're driving down the highway, and you can see up in the distance, you can see in the median, the big old silver state highway patrol, likely in the uh, Chevy Tahoe format, the big billboard side, what does traffic do? Everyone just slows down. Do you realize why they're slowing down? Every single one of them has the right to be on the road, but they don't rule it. Every single one sees the state trooper and they say, well, I'm not in charge here, and I'm going to kind of follow the rules. Do we recognize that the birth of Jesus Christ, some of us need to see something and say, you know what, I, I need to slow down. I'm not the ruler of this place. I'm not, I'm not in charge and there's a simple recognition of who is in charge. I want to say this, that, that when we say Jesus is Lord, the vernacular can be lost. The, the term Lord, I mean, I'm, I'm playing semantics here, but we go, eh, Lord, we don't really use that term. So what if we thought for just briefly, you know what, Jesus is, is the highway patrol of my life. Do we, do we concept that? Jesus is the, the trooper over over my destination. What about this one? What about Jesus is the mayor of my life? To think about it in that way. To just take the same semblance of Lord and change a little bit. Let me, I'm going to tell a story. Uh, we're out eating tacos around the corner. And Mayor Mark, uh, Heath's mayor, comes in. And I see him. I nod at him. He nods at me. We know each other from past discussions. And I tell the kids, I was like, hey, the mayor's here. And they're so excited. Like, the mayor? Which, by the way, they think like the mayor has this innate, amazing ability to, to get away with anything and do anything. So like if they're ever mad at me, they'll say, well, we're going to go tell the mayor. And I'm like, I know him. He's not going to do anything. But anyway, I introduce them, and I'm like, hey, guys, this is the mayor. Now, I was cool for about 30 seconds to my kids because I knew the mayor, and they couldn't believe it. Okay, now here's the thing. So, so Mayor Mark's sitting there. He's eating dinner with his family. I'm eating dinner with my family, and I say, hey, mayor. Okay, now think about it for a second. We have a governor over us, right? Mike DeWine. If I were to, if I were to say to Mark, our mayor, and say, hey, hey, Mark, you're my mayor, he'd be like, yeah. All right, man. And he'd dip another chip in the salsa and keep going. If I was to drive to, to Columbus and uh, figure out where, where Mike DeWine, you know, spends his night and pound on the door and be like, Mikey, you're my governor. Be like, all right, dude, get off my lawn. Go home. Why is this kid, why is this guy here? Yeah. 
if I, if I were to call up, I'm not going to drive all the way out there, but if I was to call up D.C., if I was like, hey, uh, patch me through the White House, I'd be like, yeah, sure thing, why not? And, I, and I, get, I get Joe on the phone. I'm like, Joe, wake up. Joe, you're my president. He'd be like, all right, sure thing. But here's the difference. When I say, Jesus, you're my king, See, I can, I can acknowledge who my mayor is. I can acknowledge who my governor is. I can acknowledge who my president is. And they're, they're, for the most part, they may just get, oh, yeah, okay. But when we say, hey, Jesus, you're my king, he does something beautiful. He says, since you've claimed me as Lord, since you've claimed me as king, I, I want to give you grace. He says, uh, because you've claimed me as Lord, because you've claimed me as king, I want to give you a special place. What? Since you've claimed me as king, since you have claimed me as Lord, listen to this. I want to be with you. I'm not kicking you off my front lawn. I want to give you an internal embrace. I want to walk not only beside you, I want to be with you, and and my spirit is going to be with you. Listen. Listen. I was not invited, nor did I expect for Mayor Mark to be like, hey, come sit down with my family, enjoy. I didn't expect, or was I invited in this hypothetical situation, for Governor Mike to invite me in and say, hey, come sit on my couch. You know, that wouldn't happen. But do we realize that, that Mark, he's got a town or a city, whatever you want to call this place. Mike's got a state. He's got from like the lake to the river and in between, like we nudge Pennsylvania and Indiana. And Joseph, Joe, he's, he's got this country and like a floating half country in Alaska and a couple islands out west. But King Jesus is Lord not only of all. He's Lord of our lives. He's Lord of this cosmic realm. He is Lord of everything. And he doesn't shrug and say, yeah, I know I am. He says, I love you. And I want to save you. He says, I love you. I want to give you something better. He says, I want you to come to my table. And listen, this isn't a one-time thing. I want you to keep coming. I want you to feast with me. I want you to find brothers and sisters that know me and claim me as Lord. And I want you to come together. I want you to break bread. And I want you to take the cup. Because listen, I'm no longer calling you my subject. I'm no longer calling you lowly. I'm calling you family. I'm calling you friend. He says, I want you. I want to give you that. And all of a sudden, our recognition of Jesus as Lord, he just pours it all out. All of a sudden, when we look at the little candle on the little cake, and we pause long enough to go, you know what? Jesus is Lord. I'm not going to claim this one. If we pause and say, this party, this moment is for the King of Kings, and I, and I don't need to wear the crown. And this is absolutely hard. Because we walk into a life where we have self-anointed ourselves as king. And if you don't believe me, go down to the toddler nursery. There's a bunch of kings battling it out over toys down there. Okay? Okay, I mean, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. Each of them has its own little kingdom of one. And some of you, you're still there. Some of you, you just, you've grown up. You're still a toddler. That was rude. Yes, it is, I know. But we still play this mentality of the kingdom of one. It's my kingdom. It's mine. I want it my way. I rule. But it's when we pause and go, you know what? I think, I've, I've known enough of my life, I'm a pretty terrible ruler of this kingdom of one. And not only that, I'm, I'm looking through the word. I'm feeling the, the dwelling place of you calling me. And God, all I want to do is, I just want to take off this crown. All I want to do is bow down. And whether, whether you are in a manger or whether you are about to walk forward in your baptism and begin your ministry, I want to call you as king. I want to know you as Lord. Here's what's beautiful about when we pause, rather than claiming the cake that's not ours, but rather when we say, Jesus, you're Lord, he does something awesome. And uh, I want to play that next video. got two brothers the one in the white shirt it is his birthday the one in the black shirt is his younger brother watch what the birthday boy does 
Where's he, where's he put that cake? See, there's something about a celebration that when we claim what's not ours, things get hostile. In the culture that this video's from, the birthday boy is to present, the birthday one is to present the first piece of cake to the one that they appreciate, the one that they love, the one that is honored. Do you realize we are that brother? That we're that little one? That, that we say to Jesus, we say, listen, listen, this is all you. You're the king, you're the Lord. And he takes that first piece of cake. He takes the best of what he has. He says, I, I want you to have it. Two birthdays. One where a sibling grabs what's not theirs and one where one receives what is not theirs. And I want all of us to understand when we celebrate the lordship of Jesus Christ, he takes this, this bounty of gifts and possessions that have all been given to us and he removes from us our sinful nature and he buries it. He takes the mess, he takes the rottenness, and he takes it upon himself at the cross. He buries it in the grave, and he rises, and he takes this big old piece of cake of his righteousness, his glory, and he says, come and feast. I have chosen you. How sweet it is to celebrate our king. And all we have to do to get to this place of celebration is to realize it's not I who wear the crown. I am not the one who is king of kings. And to truly to be able to celebrate this season, to truly get to the place where we understand what the greatest gift is, is to realize it's not me. Walk into this holiday season. We're on the fourth day of December. Tack on 20 to that. We'll be here again. We'll be doing a Christmas Eve celebration. And then we'll be walking through Christmas. That's just how the days go. Imagine walking through this season going, you know what? It's not about me this year. It's not about me. And you're like, yeah, I do that every year. Rob. Well, do we? No, you don't understand, Rob. I make it all about other people. I'm so focused on I've got to have it this way for them. No, let's hold up. Let's just make this season about what it's to be. There's a Savior. There's a King. And that we briefly for one moment realize we are not the highway patrol. We're not the mayor. We are not the governor. We are not the president. I'm going to keep going. We're not the principal. We're not the supervisor. We are not the one in charge of our very own lives. We've got to be able to have the mentality of Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. And in that same demographic, I want to say these things, and maybe one of these will hit you in a way it hasn't before. Can you say with your mouth, Jesus is supervisor. Jesus is the state trooper over the highway of my life. Jesus is the chief executive officer of the business of me. Jesus is the principal of my classroom. Jesus is the overseer. Jesus is the one. There are certain aspects of your life where the crown has been taken off, the crown has been turned over, and Jesus is Lord, and praise God for that. But I want to say this to, to everyone today, that there is a place of repentance. There is a place where we truly recognize Jesus as Lord. And this is, how do I explain repentance other than this simple way? Repentance is recognition that Jesus is Lord. And so for those of you that have claimed Jesus is Lord, I want you to take a look. Where are the places I'm not recognizing him as Lord? Where are the little avenues of my life that, you know what, I've held a little cupcake for myself. And to realize it belongs to him. Maybe it's your choices and, and how you indulge yourself, uh, whether it's entertainment. Maybe it's what goes out from you. The greetings you give, the, the financial giving you give, where you put your time and energy. Is Jesus Lord over all these things? But I want us all to be at the place where we can have and experience this greatest gift. And the way to get there as we walk through this month is to first say, it's not I. It's not I. Because I don't want you to be a people that show up at the manger 
And while there's others bowing to the king, you just shrug your shoulders and go, ah, I'm a better king. I don't know about you guys, but I could probably do a better job. Praise God it's not us. Praise God that we're not the king. That we have one we can love, we have one we can follow, and we have one that can lead our lives. I'm going to turn it over to the worship team.